Hi, everybody. So we have come to the final episode of our Summer Sippin' series. Tell me, tell me where you're calling from. Um, who's joining you today drinking the wonderful Marsan from Hoover Valley Vineyards? If you don't have this wine today, grab something else. There's some time. I'm going to be slow to start today just so that I can see who's joining in and give everyone time to get settled. If you're like me, you've had a really long week uh, going towards the end of summer. I think I expected time to slow down a little bit more, but it really hasn't. And I've been incredibly busy for the last couple of weeks. Um, I'm actually really excited for summer to come to an end. Um, then again, I don't have kids, so that's uh, school time is not affecting me like it is many others. Um, so tell me about what your summer has been like, um, what you've enjoyed about it, and if you've been watching these episodes, what your favorite episode has been. Thanks, guys, for your comments and your warm wishes. Hi, Karen and Dan. Hi, Anne. How are you? Uh, Anne is in South Carolina. That's awesome. Why didn't you invite me? Uh, Michelle and Ray, hi, good to see y'all again. And you have the Marsan, which is awesome. Anne is not sure about the whole drinking wine and watching video thing. So everyone encourage Anne to continue searching through virtual offerings with wine. Uh, hi, Christopher, hi, Kelly. Thanks for joining me, you guys. Um, we have most people joining, I think. Um, so the first thing I want to do is thank you for being here. Throughout the summer, um, I've had a good group of people who join me every single week. But really what I wanted to tell you guys is that these lessons have all been tailored to you. Um, and what that means is these have had a very high level of educational content that I chose to deep dive into specifically because you guys had the interest and you have the capability to learn at an exceptionally high level. So we covered some basics, how to drink wine, how to prepare it, how to properly enjoy it. But we also covered an immense amount of topics such as geography, the ABAs of Texas, specific grape personalities and what it's like um, when you have a single grape growing next to another grape and how they're growing differently than each other. We talked about single vineyard sites and what it's like to actually manage a vineyard. We talked about um, how to taste wine like a pro. We kind of deep dived into that the week that we talked about uh, the Par Tempranillo. If you remember, that was the fourth episode. Um, we really deep dove that week. Then we talked about Merved and how grapes travel around the world. We talked about the art of blending grapes, and that was a tough discussion. There's way more that goes into it than you think. Then we talked about um, hybrid grapes and hybrid grapes that are growing in Texas and why they're incredibly successful and why they shouldn't be forgotten. Then we talked about intriguing grapes like muscat that are growing in Texas and why those shouldn't be forgotten either. They're extremely important and some of those are the oldest grapes in the world that we're able to work with in Texas, but you may not recognize their names. And then in the past couple of weeks, we've talked about um, the unique grapes growing in Texas. We've talked about how a wine region becomes ultimately a classic wine region, such as the Russian River Valley, and why those wines are testable wines in a, say, a sommelier scenario, in a blind tasting scenario, and why Texas is ready to amp up to that recognizable style. Then we talked about um, winemaking. That was a fun week. We got to see lots of pictures of what's happening on site now. And then just last week, we talked about all of the red, uh, not all the red wine grapes. We talked about a lot of red wine grapes um, and what their stories are, what the history is, and why that makes it important why those grapes are growing in Texas. Finally, today, we are going to finish with just a light discussion about the infinite possibilities of wine. Um, first, I think let's get some wine in the glass um, so that we can have a final sip and assessment of the wine in front of us. And if you're like me, you have the Roussan as well from um, La Pradera Vineyard, the 2020 vintage that we drank in week three. If you have that, pour some of that as well. Um, I'm gonna corve in both of these today because I, I'm just not gonna finish two bottles of wine in the next week. All right, if you haven't told me where you're calling from, tell me, tell me, I wanna know. 
Hi, Aileen. Thanks for joining again. Hi, Tracy. Tracy's drinking red wine today. Good for you. You drink what you like. Brian, hi. How are y'all? Terry, good to see you again. Catherine, good to see you. And Sherry, hi from Lago Vista. Who are we missing? Jennifer and Alan, good to see y'all. Oh, man, I'm just destroying this uh, foil. Fun fact, did y'all know that the foil is one of the most expensive parts of the bottle, which is why there is a proper way to remove foil, and it's not the way that I just did. Um, deserves a little bit of respect when, when winemakers have to pay a lot of money for it. All right, so if you haven't seen my Corvin before, it's just a tool that has a medical grade needle, pushes through the cork so that I don't have to open these bottles. And then it will allow me to pour as much of this wine as I want. So last episode, if there's anything that was confusing in the last couple of weeks, and by couple, I mean 12 weeks, um, let me know what was confusing. What can I clarify for you? I know that I can speak semi-eloquently sometimes, and then sometimes my words just get all jumbled up. So please tell me um, what is still jumbled in your mind, what you could use clarification on, or tell me if you feel like a wine expert now. Um, and if that's the case, then yay for us. Um, I, For those who are just joining, I mentioned that I tailored these lessons to you guys, meaning that I chose difficult content because I know that all of you can handle it and want to know those things. So congratulations to everyone for making it through 12 weeks of uh, summer sipping class with William Chris Wine Company. All right, so in my glass here, I have the Marsan from Hoover Valley Vineyard. And in my glass here, I have the Roussan that we drank in week three from La Pradera Vineyards. These are both 2020 vintage. So I want to drink these next to each other. One of the things we talked about um, weeks and weeks ago was how helpful it is to have a glass of wine next to the glass of wine that you're drinking. Because while food and wine pairs really well together, wine and wine pairs really well together. The things in this glass will help push out things in this glass that I didn't notice before and vice versa. The other cool thing that I did is Roussan and Marsan are commonly blended together in a region called uh, the Rhone. And that is in France. So if you're Looking at a map of France, and you go to the southeast side, um, right up where um, the northern part of Spain kind of meets, that is the Rhone. It's separated into two areas, the northern Rhone and the southern Rhone. William Chris Vineyards works with grapes that grow in both of those parts. In the northern Rhone, you will see Marsan. That is the number one white grape that's grown in the northern Rhone. That is very hilly, kind of mountainous, very steep areas. Syrah is the number one red grape that's growing there. Marsan grows there as well, and so does Viognier. Texas is working with all of those grapes, so it makes sense. In the Southern Road, you see a lot of blends. This is where your Grenache, Syrah, Merved, um, this is where your Cinso is growing, this is where some Carignan is growing, you see some Tanat growing there as well. And then your white grapes are kind of the same. Viognier, um, you see Grenache Blanc, and then Marsan and Roussan. So all of those grapes in the Rhone area are doing fantastically in Texas. What we see is them con commonly blended together in France. But in Texas, what we're seeing is these in individual styles. So I'm tasting these next to each other so I can imagine what they complement about each other because you don't blend without the intent to complement. One of these is maybe adding color. One of them is maybe very fruity and the other one is very earthy. And that's a complementary style. At William Chris Vineyards, we love to pull the blends, uh, blending grapes out of the blend and see how they shine by themselves. So that way we can not only get a snapshot of the grapes, but a snapshot of the single vineyard site that these grapes came from. And that's a singular expression, the ultimate snapshot of one grape, one place in one year. And that's what we love to do. That's why you've been here for 12 weeks with us. I'm very sentimental about finishing this series and I'm so happy that all of you have joined me. All right, I'm gonna see who else may have joined. Hi, Scott in Tennessee, thanks for joining. Kelly, oh, good question. Uh, why is there foil on the bottle? Is it for looks or are there other purposes behind it? That's a great question. I don't know where the origin behind that um, came from, but my, uh, my understanding is that it's partially for protection of the cork. 
if um, something gets to the cork like mold or some sort of bacteria, it can actually eat away at the cork because remember this is organic material, it's wood. Um, if it gets water damage, if it gets um, you know the wrong kind of mold that eats away at it, it can damage the cork. And then you don't have that little micro oxygenation through the cork, you have much more oxygenation and it will turn your wine into vinegar. Uh, which is not what we want. We want a slow micro oxygenation and the foil helps protect that process. Um, of course, you do get a little bit of stuff underneath the foil, which is why you'll often see me wiping the top before I pour. Um, that's just part of what the foil does. It's mainly to protect that micro oxygenation process. Um, but you can't just put any old foil on top of here, it has to be able to be cut by a knife. It needs to not be so thin that it um, cuts you. Uh, so the type of foil that's used for this is a very particular kind and it was designed specifically for wine bottles. So there was there's a lot of thought behind it. The bottles that you don't see with foil, they're not bad bottles. It was a it was probably a conscious choice to maybe save on the cost, maybe price the bottle less for you guys. Um, and sometimes it's maybe meant to be a young drinking wine. Maybe the wine is not going to be held for long enough for anything to attack the cork. It's meant to be popped open, fresh, and, uh, and very youthful overall. Oh, Karen, we haven't had a Viognier yet. Karen says Viognier is one of their favorites. Viognier is commonly blended with these two. I'm just talking about these wines without drinking them, and it's, it's just a terrible practice. So I'm going to get into both of these wines. If you have the Roussan, tell me. Um, if you don't have the Roussan, I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm smelling and tasting in the glass. So it's like you're tasting it as well. And then we'll get into the possibilities of wine. And how we're going to do this today is we're going to talk about if this wine was made in a different way, what would it taste like instead? And this is a practice that I really, really enjoy. And I've shared some of my practices with you, you know, dropping um, an apricot pit in your wine so that you can smell the apricot pit notes in the wine. Um, I did that with the Mary Ruth. I dropped some tarragon in the wine to help me tap into the tarragon notes in that wine. This is another practice. Um, you have a glass of wine in front of you, and if you're having trouble tapping into what's special about it, you have to imagine how it could have been treated differently and what the flavor would have, what the flavor impact would have been after that. So today we're just going to imagine how this wine could have been different, and that's going to help us tell why it's special in this form. So I hope y'all are ready to be very discussion-based today. Jennifer, that's a that's great feedback. Jennifer says my Roussan is a bit too cold, tight flavor. Great, swirl it up pour it into another glass, maybe decant it. It'll warm up as we talk. And I'm really interested to hear from you, Jennifer, how it opens up as we continue tasting it throughout here. I'm glad you have a Roussan. Uh, Christopher as well. Kelly, the, the Marsan makes you think of grapefruit. I can't wait to get into this. I know what Marsan is known for. And it's known for having a lot of different flavor compounds. So this is a wine I actually haven't tried yet. I don't know what to expect when I get into this. Awesome. Karen, thank you so much for that note. Um, I, I know a lot of y'all have been watching and maybe have enjoyed some of these lessons. Next time y'all are out on site at William Chris Vineyards, you know that I work um, partially remotely. Let me know whenever you're going out so I can either be there for you and say hi, uh, maybe pour you a tasting, or um, just make sure that you have the best experience possible on site. You're always welcome to reach out to me and stay in touch as well. All right, who's ready for the actual tasting of this wine? All right, let's look at the color first, always my favorite part. All right, so I see a really intriguing color here. I see straw and it's very light in intensity, but you know what I see around the rim of this? And I'm cheating because I know too much about the Marsan grape. I see some flecks of pink and I see a little bit of like gold or, or uh, there's, there's just a dusty color here. It looks like a piece of metal, which is really beautiful. And what's going to help me tap into what those colors are is looking at it next to the Roussan. 
The Roussan is darker pigment. It looks thick and creamy. It looks almost like butter. So that's a much more yellow tone. This uh, Marsan is much more um, like metal. It's cool colors, whereas the Roussan is warm colors. That's entirely to do with the oxygenation of the wine, how much oxygen was in contact with the wine, deepening that color. And it has to do with the color of the grape skin. And you guessed it, Marsan has a pinkish um, kind of gray brown skin color. It's just like Roussan where it has a bit of pigment on the outside, um, but when it's pressed, the skins are taken out of the process. So you only get a hint of their color. Now imagine in our infinite possibilities of this wine, imagine if this wine had set with the skins for a while, what color this wine would be. It would take on that pinkish grayish brown color. It may even turn into a rosé color if you let the skin sit with this. If that process happened, what we would have is an orange wine. Regardless of what the exact color is, if you have a white wine grape and you're letting it sit with the skins for an extended amount of time, and this could be 30 to 60 days, you're getting the color from the skin, you're getting the tannin and the flavor compounds from the skin, and you're ultimately making an orange wine. It will smell and taste totally different than this. Not only will you have that structure and flavor compounds from the skin, you'll have increased bottle, body and you'll have... Um, you'll have the juice plus the skin component. In here, you're just getting the juice. This is a fresh expression of Marsan. So let's see what that smells like. Oh my gosh. Oh, it's just, um, it's like a honeysuckle pear candy, isn't it? It's like, um, it's like a pear lollipop, but it has this really, you know, Marsan is such a cool grape. Um, it's known for flavors like it's known for organic floral flavors. Think like if you're walking into a fairyland forest, what you would get there. You get the candied fruits, yes, you get leaves, but you also get like beeswax. You can get pollen. It's not just flowers. It's that pollen aspect. It's, it's that other, other stuff that's so unique and interesting to find in this wine. And that's kind of what hits me first. It's like just a puff of pollen in my face right in the center and it's woven around this melon and I'm, I'm getting specifically winter melon anybody else oh I saw someone put melon in there good job yeah absolutely this is this is grapefruit it is pear and that and cherry that pear it's so candied isn't it um but it's not like an artificial pear candy. It's like if you actually took a slice of the perfectly ripe pear because the pear is really aromatic. It's ripe pear. If you just candied or caramelized that a little bit, it's this is flavor compounds amped up. It's not just pear. It's pear lifted. There's something beyond pear there. It's something that kind of builds a world around it. And that's the beauty of Marsan. Marsan adds complexity to blends. And the cool thing about this grape is as the vines age, you know, these are seven, eight year old grape vines in 50 years, those flavors will be amped up to here. So you may get like a pear quince pie that's fresh out of the oven when you smell this. And that's the beauty of wine. That's where the complexity goes. You get more intense, but also more specific flavors. There's something of like a whipped cream um, aspect to it, but the whipped cream, it's like whipped with something floral. Um, freesia, Kelly, I don't know what freesia smells like. I would have to get into that, but possibly. Um, I know that Marsan is associated with acacia and acacia is a really, really particular flavor, isn't it? Um, it's not something that I come by very often. It's very European, I understand. Green apple, absolutely. Um, I think candied apple. And I'm gonna swirl this up so I can tap into what's hiding in here. So what could be hiding in here kind of depends on the winemaking process, doesn't it? So this was pressed off the skins. It has no skin contact. And then it was fermented. It went through a special fermentation process that we'll come back to later. And then it was aged for nine months. Six of those months was in concrete and three of those months was in stainless steel. So we should have 
our aromatic intensity pretty much intact. There wasn't a ton of oxygen contact in here. So the aromatic intensity should be, should be really intact. How aromatic is this? Oh, it's, I'm having to get kind of close to it to smell it. So maybe Marsan is not known for being hugely aromatic intense, or maybe it has a medium aromatic intensity. So in our infinite possibilities, what could have made this more or less aromatic? And let's just think about that. If this wine had spent some time in oak, it may be a little bit less aromatic, or maybe the aromas that we would be getting would be more woody. Maybe they would be more nutty and less fruity. Maybe um, if this was aged in stainless steel only, the aromatic intensity would be completely sealed in and it would just explode out of the glass. So maybe that concrete egg aging has done something to the aromatics here. It's altered it in one way or another. And ultimately that affects the way that we have the relationship with what's in the glass. Oh, as I swirled this, um, it smells sharper. It smells brighter. Um, all of those pollen notes were the really subtle notes sitting on top and I don't get them as much anymore, but I know they're there and that's rewarding. And now I'm getting honey notes. Um, maybe honeysuckle was the flower in there, but definitely honey is in there for sure. And there's a strong minerality and it's, there's so much apple in there. This is like, <laughs> I feel like I'm going to bite into an apple. The melon notes have kind of fallen back a little bit. Absolutely, Alan, um, Marsan and Rusan would both pair with turkey, both of them. Kind of depends the way you're serving it. This uh, maybe with just white meat, if it was lightly smoked, this is a really fresh, fruity wine, it seems like. The Rusan has more nuts, it has more creaminess, so maybe if you have a cream gravy over your turkey, this is more your choice. Kind of depends if you have some sort of sauce over it. Um, it kind of depends what the sauce is. Um, I noticed cherry notes in the Roussan before. So if you have cranberry on the table, maybe the Roussan is your choice. Pair to the sides. The meat is the, fre the friendly part to wine. Your sides are what's really going to define it. That's a really good question. All right. I can't wait to take a sip of this. I'm still getting uh, melon and grapefruit notes off of this. This is very fruity. Oh, wow. That's really intriguing on the palate. Kind of takes you through a journey. So I expected this to be fuller in body because there was so much on the note, but it's pleasantly light and, um, it's, it's, um, it's light and delicate, but there's so much flavor there. Um, something we talk about when um, tasting wine is we talk about the finish of the wine, how long it takes for the positive flavors to remain on your tongue. I'm still going through a journey with this wine. I'm getting some smoky hits now. I'm just now tasting the minerality. And before that, it was those melon notes. And before that, it was those green apple notes. And before that, it was all flowers. I think this is a, such a lovely texture, don't you guys? Now there's tartness to this wine. There's acidity in all wine because we're working with fruit here. But the acidity isn't raging high. It's very much in balance with the wine. If this wine is still too tart for you because everyone tastes wine differently and every, everyone registers acidity and tannin differently, decanting this I think would be a great option. And here's why. This is a light bodied, fairly aromatic wine. What would happen if we decanted this wine? And this is part of those infinite possibilities. It's not just how the grape is grown, how long the vines have been in ground. It's not just how they're harvested and how the wine is made. It's how you treat it afterwards. So this ultimately started out as a fresh flower and fruit wine with medium intensity, just a little kiss of acidity on the palate and a long finish. What can you change from here? You have so much power. If you warm it up, the fruit's going to fall back a little bit and all that other stuff is going to play a little bit higher. So you're going to have a different experience with this wine if you warm it up a little bit. If you chilled this down even further, and mine's probably at 50 degrees here, if you chilled it down further, your fruit is going to shine. You're going to have melon and green apple and it's going to be like eating a fresh piece of fruit, but in a wonderful bottle of wine on a really hot day. 
that's awesome. That's a totally different experience and you have power over that. And then if you decant this, what have we noticed about decanting over the last 12 weeks? It kind of brings the acidity into balance. So the acidity will no longer be so apparent here. It'll still be the same acidity, but it won't be as apparent. Remember, decanting does not change how much acid is in the wine. You'll also notice an increase in creamy texture. And that's something that the Marsan grape is known for. It can have a creamy or oily texture, which tells me that maybe this wine has the possibility to be more textural if I treat it in a different way. And I think decanting would absolutely do that. But I am sincerely enjoying this wine just the way it is. Perfect temperature for me. I don't want to decant it right now. I'm having such a lovely journey with this wine. But know that those infinite possibilities are partially like a third up to you. A third is the wine grower, a third is the winemaker, one third is how you treat your wines. And I hope you feel empowered to do some crazy stuff with your wines. Francisco is a Marsan lover. How did I already know that about you, Francisco, without even talking to you about it? This is the first Marsan I've had from William Chris Vineyards. I've been a Marsan lover for a very long time because it has that texture. Um, and when it's done right, man, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Mm. So I'm going to read through a couple of your comments because there have been some great ones so far. Um, Alan, I'm going to go back and say, please get a bottle of both of these. I think the most fun thing at Thanksgiving is to have two to five bottles of wine open on your table so people can experiment and have fun. Please go with both of them. Or cook your turkey in the Roussan. Wouldn't that be cool, too, if you had, like, a white wine um, braising of the turkey? Oh, man. Kelly, great comment. I think that if this were aged in oak, it would remind you of a smooth Chardonnay. And certainly, uh, Marsan is known as being a good alternative for Chardonnay lovers. So, you know, you don't see a lot of Chardonnay in Texas because it's a cool climate grape variety. So what else could you love in Texas if you can't find Chardonnay? Marsan and Roussan, absolutely. If you like the fruitier, kind of light, crisp styles of Chardonnay, this is perfect for you. If you like a little bit more oak in body, certainly go for the Roussan or find an oaked Marsan. We have not oaked this Marsan, and that was a personal choice. So in our infinite possibilities, let's imagine if this wine went through some new oak aging, and that means the oak barrels are imparting flavor and allowing oxygen to get to the wine. So first, let's look at the flavors that would be added to this. If it's French oak, it's your cinnamon, clove, baking spice palette. There would be vanilla in this. That would complement these flavors so well. Maybe you wouldn't notice all of the smaller, finer notes of the Marsan, like that pollen, maybe that wouldn't be the first thing to hit your nose. I think maybe vanilla and cinnamon would be, and that would be absolutely lovely. It pairs so well with the melon and green apple in this. But now let's look at what the oxygen would do to this wine. More oxygen aging of this wine would tone down the fruit and bring out other flavors, maybe nuttiness, maybe this would be more honey. Maybe this would be um, more of that beeswax, more of other things, and maybe more. Maybe there would be earthiness that would pop out of this. I think the minerality would shed itself a little bit more. So you have a completely different wine made from the same grapes just because it went through oak aging. Now imagine if that oak was neutral, meaning it wasn't imparting that baking spice or vanilla palette. So this wine, say it went through neutral oak aging, for 10 months. It's a pretty long time. You have oxygen getting to this wine. It would deepen the color. It would maybe be more of a golden color, similar to the Roussan, which was treated with oak. This is a great example of how the color shifts with oak aging. Then imagine how these flavors would have transformed. You would have maybe a little bit less aromatic intensity. You would have more nut, more beeswax, more of that honey note. Maybe your flowers would turn more into a flower oil instead of fresh flowers. And I know that's a very, very subtle thing to think about, but it changes the entire impression of the wine. So you have something deeper, you have something darker, you have something that's less fresh and crisp, and it has more roundness, it has more of that earth character. 
Is that something that you're into? If so, that sounds delicious to me. This grape could have been treated in so many different ways. So what's helping me tap into this wine is thinking about what are winemakers intended with this? I'm getting a raw expression of this grape because of that concrete and stainless steel aging. So I can see intact that fruit, that complexity that these grapes started out with, what the aromatic intensity started out with being with this Marsan. It hasn't been so affected that it's really changed what it originally was, if that makes sense. So now let's look at this Roussan because it was treated very differently than the Marsan. This grape starts out with stone fruit characters. It gets much less tropical than something like Marsan, and it comes with nuttiness. It comes with a lot of that other savory character. It's just less fruity of a grape. So it's already starting off at a very different place than this Marsan. And then we treated it with neutral oak and just a kiss of new oak. I think it's 5% new oak on this wine and 95% uh, is neutral oak and concrete as well. And it was fermented in stainless steel. So let's see how different this wine is than the Marsan. So much honey. I get, um, I get syrup and I get caramelized flavors. That is such a point of difference to this. I do get fruit, but it's really hiding underneath. And I think once I swirl this, that's when the fruit's going to come out. And that was kind of the opposite of the Marsan, wasn't it? This is a complex wine. Um, Jennifer, I think you're absolutely right. The Marsan is lighter. Um, the Roussan may seem more complex because it has more body. Um, this is really pushing out of the glass. It really is speaking about what it is. This has earthiness to it too. And it kind of has a cinnamon stick thing. And cinnamon stick is something that could either be from the oak aging of this wine, but there was only 5% new oak on this wine, which means some of that cinnamon stick thing is coming from the grape itself. Uh, that's interesting. much more weight and creaminess. Absolutely. And I'm getting that cinnamon stick flavor. It's very woody. And the woodiness we know is coming from the grape itself. I absolutely see why these are commonly blended together. And honestly, what I'm probably going to do, um, if I had a third glass here, I would blend these two together and taste them together. Um, and that's one of our infinite possibilities. Why did we choose to bottle the Marsan separately than the Roussan? Why didn't we blend them together? Here's my guess, and you can certainly postulate in the comments if you would like. The Marsan had such a subtle, fruity, flower, floral, um, whipped cream journey. It's very light and delicate. The Roussan has power and it has intensity. It has earthiness and it has much less fruit. Certainly the fruit would complement the earthiness of the Roussan and that nut and that creaminess. The texture would certainly complement the Marsan. It would kind of lift it a little bit. But we would get less of that subtlety. The flavors that are strongest will speak over the flavors that are more subtle, which is okay. Blends are beautiful things. They're, they're complex and they're subtle and you can have a real journey with them. But certain things could have gotten forgotten in either one of these wines. This, the most subtle notes of the Roussan would maybe get lost because there's so much going on. And the Marsan, which is a, just a more delicate expression altogether, would maybe get a little bit lost. I think bottling these separately just means we get more personality from either of these. And isn't the personality totally different? I think most of us will gravitate towards one or the other. And y'all know I love this Roussan, but I am actually gravitating towards the Marsan. I think this has, has stuff that I've never, never tasted in wine before. And that's the magic. The Roussan does too. I freaking love this wine. But you know, what attracts you to a wine is often unexpected. And that push of pollen through the center of the glass is just mesmerizing and capturing to me. And I like that it's subtle. I like that it's not as impactful as the Roussan and that I have to kind of be on my toes to get everything about this wine. What do y'all think? Is one or the other standing out to you? Or if you didn't taste the Roussan or if you didn't have the Marsan, what sounds more your style? I think uh, everyone would choose one or the other, but if anyone is equal on both, tell me. 
Uh, Lane, I want to answer your question. I did see it. Um, the Rusan color is absolutely beautiful. I agree. Um, does it have that same kind of oily feel? Um, and what does oily mean? What does oily even mean? So when we talk about texture in wine, we're talking about a huge realm of textures that, I mean, some of te the textures we have words for, but some of them can really only be described by metaphor. And some of them, I mean, how do you really truly describe texture? It's different, difficult. So there are some common texture words that we say, velvety versus silky. You know what that touch is. You have to kind of translate it to what it feels like on your tongue. Velvety has more weight. It's um, a little bit, you know, if you were passing it over your tongue, it would pass over slower than something like silk, which is just kind of wispy and light. Um, we also talk about creamy. Creaminess is something that Chardonnay from particularly California or Russian River Valley is associated with. Creaminess is something that um, has weight. Imagine, imagine drinking milk versus heavy cream. When we talk about creaminess, we talk more towards that heavy cream spectrum. We talk about watery. Watery is a texture. Are you drinking water here or is it just a little bit more viscous than that? And finally, we often talk about oily and this is something a little bit different. It's viscous with a little bit of drag. Um, you know, it, it, it really clings to your tongue and it's, um, it has a different kind of movement to it. And imagine oil in water, how it doesn't, it doesn't move with the water. It kind of moves in its own way. When you have an oily grape, you have something really special. And it may sound like a bad thing, but oily is a texture that you should look for and really, really appreciate. And I'll, I'll explain this in one other way. Imagine when you're eating almonds. When you're eating almonds, they're crunchy, yes, but there's an oily texture there as well. You have a crunch and you have, it's not creaminess, it's oiliness. And it's, it's, in all nuts, when we're eating nuts, we have that oily thing, and it's something you either love or you hate. I love that. And when it's present in wine, I find it often comes with those nutty notes for whatever reason. I think the Roussan and the Marsan both have oily textures, and Viognier is known for the same thing. Um, they have this waxy quality, they have beeswax, they have pollen, and they have an oily texture. And I think that's really, really fun about um, hot climate grape varieties. I think with hot climate grape varieties, you find that as, as the grapes ripen more, they get more of that oily texture. So why is the Roussan more oily than the Marsan? And I want you to look at the back of your bottles when you buy wine or when you're about to open a bottle. This is something that'll help you really tap into what you may be getting. The Roussan is 13.9% alcohol. That's on the higher spectrum of your white wines. Um, and that's probably medium to high for red wines. For the Marsan, you have 12.7% alcohol. It's a big difference. It's over one point a percentage of alcohol difference. That's a major difference. So with the Marsan, you're getting almost a light alcohol content. For your wine, maybe towards the medium, and Roussan is on the higher end. That absolutely impacts the body of your wine. Alcohol is responsible partially for the weight of your wine. So when I said this was a little bit lighter than I expected, the Marsan, that's probably because the alcohol is lower. And the Roussan is rich and creamy. That is partially because the alcohol is higher. So if you're looking for a light bodied wine and you pick up a Pinot Noir, but you didn't notice that the Pinot Noir is 16% alcohol. You're not exactly getting maybe the lightest body Pinot Noir that you can. Find a Pinot Noir or another wine that is 12% in alcohol. It's a big, big difference. You're gonna have a lighter mouth feel. You're probably gonna have um, a little bit brighter acidity because sugar and acidity are related. If your sugar is up here and your acidity is here, that sugar is gonna be translated to alcohol in fermentation. Your alcohol is going to end around here and your acidity is going to end around here. But imagine if they're a little bit more balanced. Those translate directly. And I hope that made sense. So if the Marsan had ripened on the vine for a little bit longer, the sugar would have built up a little bit more and we would have more alcohol in this wine. But why didn't we do that? Why didn't we capture that oily texture? 
And this is something that's very specific about Marsan. Marsan is often harvested earlier than you would expect so that the acidity doesn't fall too low. And this is Marsan specific. Marsan towards the end of ripening tends to have the acidity fall very quickly. So in order to have this beautiful kiss of acidity, we have to ripen a little bit earlier and the sugar doesn't build up as much. So we get a lighter bodied wine. I hope that made sense. Roussan doesn't have that same thing. We can harvest a little bit later. The acidity doesn't fall quite as much and we have a richer, more oily texture. All right, I missed a lot of comments. So I'm gonna go back and answer all of yours without getting carried away. Christopher is noticing that textural difference. Francisco likes the Roussan and the Marsan equally, brave man. The Marsan, Jennifer, reminds you of a French Chablis. Absolutely. When I said crisp, unoaked Chardonnay, that's exactly what I'm talking about. This has minerality and it has a, it has fruitiness and it has aromatic intensity without all that oakiness. That's a Chablis thing. And I think that is a very fair comparison. Oh, Jennifer, I don't know if you're talking about butterscotch for the Roussan or the Marsan, but I kind of get butterscotch in the Marsan now that you say it. And definitely butterscotch and caramel on the uh, Roussan. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just reading some of your comments. Um, Catherine, great question. What is the difference between decanting and using an aerator with a wine that doesn't have sediment? Great question. So what, what Catherine's already identified here is decanting is used for mainly two different purposes. One is to allow your wine to get in more contact with oxygen and to breathe. And two, to separate any sediment. And this is for aged wines. Um, so if we're talking about just letting the wine breathe, Decanting versus aerating when you put, you know, a tool on top of your wine to um, kind of spread out the surface area, there's no difference. The difference is how easy it is for you to use. If you don't want to have a decanter on the table, if you keep breaking your decanters, whatever the reason may be that you don't want to use a decanter, aerating will do the same thing. The only reason that I prefer decanters instead of aerators is because I often double decant and I pour from one vessel to another. Um, I also use my decanters to change temperature a little bit. So it gives me a little bit more um, room to do what I want. With an aerator, it's spreading out a cert certain amount of surface area um, at a consistent rate. With decanting, you can use your decanter in several different ways. So you can decant so that the wine just pours down the center towards the bottom. I'm sorry, you can't see that down the bottom, or you can decant where you're splashing the wine over all of this so that it spreads out as it's going down. So you kind of control how much contact your wine has with oxygen. That being said, the difference is what it is to you. Um, it's, it's what tools make the most sense for the way you enjoy wine. Um, I, I have never had an aerator, so I can't say that I'm for or against aerators. Um, I've, always been able to enjoy my wine in whatever way I need to by using the tools around me. Just reading through a couple comments. How, Kelly, how would the Marsan behave if decanted while keeping it chilled? It would warm up a little bit um, in the decanter unless your decanter is chilled as well, but otherwise it would still affect the balance. You're still getting oxygen in contact with the wine, which means the structure is, um, is shifting as it's in contact with oxygen. And remember your structure is your alcohol. So the alcohol may become more or less apparent. Your acidity, which will become more or less apparent. Any residual sugar, and there's about one gram of residual sugar in this Marsan. That sweetness will become more or less apparent, probably a little bit less apparent, I would think. And uh, what else is part of structure? Tannin, if you have any tannin in the wine. Um, will usually become a little bit less apparent, like with the Tanat. Um, you may notice that your texture changes. Your flavor compounds can also start to change. So your, your fruitiness may shift down a little bit and your other characters may be able to emerge. So maybe if you're decanting while the wine is cold, you'll notice the minerality a little bit more and you'll notice the melon note less. That's a, that's a possibility for your wine, for what it, what it could do. 
Alan, great. Um, I see what you were going with. The Roussan is from the Texas High Plains and the Marsan is from the Texas Hill Country. And where exactly in the Texas Hill Country do you ask? Well, right here. So um, what I'm showing you here is, oh no, I don't want to change the route. Uh, I'm showing you here the journey from William Chris Vineyards all the way up to Hoover Valley Vineyard. And that's uh, still in the Texas Hill Country right above Bell Mountain. And just to give you a an idea of all of Texas. See up where Lubbock is, that is where your Roussan came from. And where the red dot is there, that is Hoover Valley Vineyard. So we're just about 55 minutes uh, north, north east of where William Chris Vineyards is. And I hope that was a cool map and, and helpful to help you picture. So yeah, let's look at an infinite possibility here. Uh, what if the Marsan gro grapes were grown in the Texas High Plains? How would that change things? So we know what the Texas High Plains is defined by, and that is hot days, cold nights, and it is a platform that's raised up to the sun. You have really flat area, you have wind kind of funneling through, and you have your grapes lifted up towards the sun, which means you can get more ripeness, which means more sugar, which means more alcohol, and your cold nights are helping preserve the acidity, which means that this Roussan, it's higher in alcohol because the acidity was able to be preserved overnight. The Marsan was born in the Texas Hill Country. So this is where you have warm air funneling through Mexico up to the Texas uh, Hill Country. You have a little bit more humidity, which means the grapes can't stay on the vine too long because they could eventually rot and you wanna try and avoid that but you also don't have quite as cold nights. So the acidity doesn't get quite as much preservation. But because you have these, gri these grapes getting warmth day and night, you have ripening happening 24 hours. Whereas in the Texas High Plains, those cold nights, that means the grapes aren't ripening overnight. The acidity is preserved, but they're not building up flavor compounds overnight and the Marsan was. So there's no better or worse here. What you're getting from the Marsan is probably a little bit lower alcohol because they had to be picked a little bit earlier in the Texas Hill Country to avoid rot, to avoid the acidity falling too low. And maybe if the Marsan was grown in the Texas High Plains, you would have higher acidity and higher alcohol as well. You have body and you have a bright through line of acidity keeping the balance. But how would that affect the flavor compounds? Maybe they would be a little bit more explosive out of the glass. Maybe there would be less flavor compounds there. Maybe the pollen would still be there and it would be more powerful, but maybe those subtle compounds of honeysuckle and beeswax would be there, but maybe not as apparent. So what you're shifting from here and here, your two wine regions, you're getting totally different personality. There's no good or bad here. You're just getting two ways to express what the land wants to express. I really hope that made sense. This is a very abstract concept to talk about. Um, and what we're doing here is we're speculating. I don't know exactly what would have happened, but of all the things we've learned over the last 12 weeks, we can speculate. It's geography, it's great personality, it's how the vineyard workers worked with these grapes. I don't know if that made sense. Tracy would choose the Marsan on a hot day. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the Marsan would be a wonderful Thanksgiving wine to bring up Alan's point. We know the Roussan would. I mean, this gold color just looks right at a Thanksgiving table with a fire going and, and turkey and food. But the Marsan would be, would be a really, really intriguing wine to serve at a Thanksgiving meal. I think it's so food friendly. Kelly says she is so associated with the, the whipped cream that I mentioned in the Marsan with that oily texture. And that's very astute as well. Yeah. <laughs> Francisco likes my wispy descriptor. Alan, I hope I answered your question about Texas High Plains versus Texas Hill Country. Um, one thing I've noticed about the Texas Hill Country is the wines are quite ageable. Um, they have to be harvested a little bit earlier but there's so much subtlety and balance there that's gathered in a really short amount of time. Um, the, the wines are quite ageable and alcohol has a big thing to do with this. When you have too high of alcohol, your ageability is a little bit more volatile. 
alcohol is a volatile thing. It can throw off your aging process. But when you have kind of low alcohol like this, you have complexity, you have acidity, this wine could potentially age for a little bit longer than this wine because of the alcohol difference. Um, so that's another big difference um, between Texas High Plains and Texas Hill Country. Francisco, we're going to talk about uplift. Don't you worry. I'm saving it for the end. Don't give it away yet. Francisco's excited for a reason. <laughs> All right. Kelly, if you'd like a Coravin, I can hook you up. If, if y'all would like a Coravin, let me know. William Chris Vineyards does sell them, of course, because we want you to have the ultimate experience with our wines. Um, and there are several different models. So you'll spend between $200 and $600 on a Coravin. And we can hook you up. You're never going to throw away wine again. Uh, Tracy, that's a great question. Do you think you're picking up pollen from the Marsan because it's from the Texas Hill Country? Absolutely. I think that has a big, big thing to do with it. So first, Marsan needs the ability to showcase flavor compounds that are coming from the soil. And certain grapes do that better than others. They showcase the flavor compounds that they're pulling from the soil. And this is a mineral, it, it's a mineral wine. You can taste the minerality. So I think, yeah, it's probably expressing the soil really well. This tells me that there's uh, maybe flowers grown nearby, uh, maybe a lot of flowers. And where grapes are grown, usually flowers are growing as well. So absolutely, I think so. Um, and this is something that you might notice from high estate wines as well. We have lots of things growing on our property. I always get oak from those wines because there are oak trees on property. Um, but if you've been out on site, you know that we have uh, a monarch garden. We have a swallowtail butterfly garden. There's tons of flowers. There's tons of things that have the ability to influence the grapes that are growing on our sites. And Hoover Valley Vineyard is no different. And second segue, Hoover Valley Vineyard was renamed. So, and Francisco, you're so welcome to help me tell this story. We see on the Marsan, it says, Hoover Valley Vineyard. This is a vineyard that we just acquired. This is one of the first wines that we've made from this property. It is 80 acres, 55 of which are planted to red and white grape varieties. Um, we just acquired it this last year. So this is our newest addition to the William Chris Wine Company um, vineyard site family. We manage it and we own it as well. So it's about an hour northwest, uh, northeast of us. Um, we have recently named it after the place that it's sitting. So this is just above Bell Mountain, which we know has a little bit of raised elevation, about 1,700 feet above sea level on average. Um, Bell Mountain has really old volcanic soil. Now just northwest of that, sits Hoover Valley Vineyard, which is on a really interesting area that's very different than Bell Mountain and very different than the rest of the Texas Hill Country. So this sits on the Llano Uplift. And I hope I said Llano correctly. I've heard people say Llano as well. So please correct me if I'm wrong on that. So the Llano Uplift is, um, it's it sounds like it was raised over time as you know bedrock and things shift some ground gets raised actually what's happened is ancient soil and i'm talking 1.4 billion year old soil has slowly eroded over time what didn't erode away was the yano uplift so as soil around this area was eroding away the the Yano uplift stayed where it was. So it's a little raised plateau. It's um, more hilly than it is flat. It stayed where it was. And that's made of decomposed granite with a little bit of silt and sand as well. Now, Bell Mountain is mostly clay and, uh, and clay and sand with um, a granite bedrock. But what you have in the Yano uplift is really old, ancient, decomposed rock. Now, over time, rock changes just like grapevines do. Grapevines shed complexity, the berries get smaller. Over time, soil and rock becomes gemstone, it becomes ruby, it becomes polished. 
it has a change as well. And all of that is impacting the grapes that are grown in this area. So not only do you have super old soil, you have really chunky soil that the grape roots can grow through really easily in search of nutrients and air and water. But you also have this unique mineral complexity in the soil that certainly influences how these grapes are formed. And I think that has some responsibility for how much minerality and pollen and other things that you can taste in this. Now, we partially named this Uplift Vineyard um, because we've acquired it and it has new life now that we've acquired it and we're gonna start doing new beautiful things. We want to uplift this area. We want, and by we I mean Chris and Bill, they wanna shed some light on this area, how special it is why it's called the Yano Uplift, and how it could potentially become another sub-AVA within the Texas Hill Country AVA. And this is why we're talking about this wine today. This is potentially the future of William Chris Wine Company. This is one of the things that we're hoping to shed light on, not just wine and single vineyard sites and everything that's going on in Texas, the Texas High Plains being responsible for the majority of the grapes in Texas and the Texas Hill Country being responsible for some of the most hardy and disease resistant grapes in Texas. But now even more specific sites like this that deserve recognition and have not been recognized in quite the way they should have been before. So this Hoover Valley Vineyard slash Uplift Vineyard project is the new horizon for William Chris. And this is something that we will be telling stories about and you will see more press about this um, in Texas as we hopefully shed more light through wines like the Marsan. What you'll also probably see from here is things like Sangiovese, Alianico, Montepulciano, Roussan, Trebbiano, and more. There are, I think, 16 different grape varieties growing in that, uh, in that area. Um, so... Stay tuned on all of that. And every time you come into William Chris, ask how Hoover Valley is doing. But make sure you say uplift because um, we'll, we'll make it easier to figure out. Um, I'm kind of sad that it was renamed after this label was made. I don't know if the label would be able to be changed now, but this is kind of an insider fact. If you watch this series, you know that when we say Hoover Valley Vineyard here, it's actually secretly called Uplift, and now you know why. So I hope all of y'all will go forth and continue to share the word about the Summer Sippin' series, encourage people who didn't get to watch this to go back and watch again, or pick up the last Summer Sippin' pack, which is still posted on the website, and watch, watch the last four episodes again. Um, this is going to remain on the Facebook Live page so that you can continue with your wine education and uh, hopefully become Texas wine experts more so than a lot of people are in Texas right now. We're a new wine growing region, um, but fast growing. So you guys will be the experts that will spread the word about what's happening here. Alan says the Texans say Lano, gotcha. I, I learned how to say that in Denver, Colorado actually, which, is, which just sounds wrong, doesn't it? <laughs> Sherry, great. If you want a Corvin as well, I have got you. Um, something I mentioned last week is that we have more broken hands. Um, this was Evan's Winemaker Series. Uh, it's $54 a bottle plus your discount. Um, for those of you who uh, said that they would like one, I'm still going to reach out to you. Don't worry, Lori, Kelly, and Karen, I have got you. If you would like a Coravin and you're commenting here and seem interested, I'll reach out to you as well. And uh, you just let me know what you'd like. I can always, always help you out. Um, fun fact, uh, at Uplift Vineyard, when it was Hoover Valley Vineyard, Francisco, Francisco, you were there. Yeah, Francisco and I went and pruned some of the vines back, um, which was really, really fun. It, it's a beautiful, beautiful vineyard, and it has, has a lot of personality. It's very close to Lake Buchanan and uh, the Colorado River both of which are major influencing points. So when you have a, a lake or a river close by, you may get some sunlight reflection from the river or the water, helping to extra ripen the grapes and build up more flavor compounds, thicker skins, more pigment. But also you can get um, a, a little bit of a cooling influence. The water will help the temperatures stay a little bit more, not too hot. They'll be a little bit more tame and uh, balanced.
Uh, Christopher, yes, thank you for your question. Can I tell us what the future is for the next virtual tasting for William Chris? At this time, I'm so sorry, but I can't. That does not mean that we won't be in touch. Um, you will see on our Facebook page and in your emails, if you're subscribed to the William Chris Vineyard emails, you will see when the next virtual offering is going to happen. And I know I said I would share a discount code today. It's not able to happen today, but I will make sure that y'all get um, everything that you need to attend our next virtual session. Um, the reason we don't know what it's going to be is we just finished harvesting the Texas Hill Country. Now we're harvesting a lot in the Texas High Plains. Um, there's no predicted end date right now. So Chris Brundrett and Catherine and the whole rest of the team, especially the winemaking team, is uh, extremely busy right now. And uh, it's just not the time to start those winemaker tastings again. But that doesn't mean they won't happen very, very soon. It's just going to be a little bit later than we expected this year. That is a good thing because it means that our wine growers are focusing on making you the most delicious wine possible. Um, and then they'll be back in touch to teach you all about it in the next couple of weeks. Um, so no fear, we will make sure that all of you are the first to know about these virtual offerings. Um, if you haven't signed up for the um, William Chris newsletter, you can go to our website at williamchriswines.com. And at the bottom of the page, there's a place to put in your email. So that way you can get up to date with um, everything that's happening virtually. But if, you're, if you've liked this uh, Facebook page or the YouTube page, we'll make sure that you um, get updated through Facebook as well. All righty, guys. We're coming to the end, so if you have any more questions... This is the time, if I missed one of your questions, post it in again so that I can answer. Uh, Jennifer, yes, I did say 55 acres. Um, Uplift Vineyard is 80 acres total. 55 are planted to grapes. Um, it is machine and hand harvested. We do drip irrigation there. Um, and it's a really unique combination of really, really old soil. Uh, it's pretty windy up there as well. It's fairly unique for the Texas Hill Country and very, very vital to that area because it's so humid. We're um, a little far east. Uh, Tracy, great question. What red grapes grow up at the, the uh, Lano Uplift? Um, a lot of Italian grape varieties are growing there now. Olianico, Montepulciano, Sangiovese. Um, I'm not sure if there's any Tanat, but possibly. Tempranillo, probably. Cabernet Sauvignon is growing there as well. Um, and then I, uh, I believe Grenache and Syrah are growing there as well. So all of your staples for Texas. Um, and I, Francisco, fill in any others that you know of that uh, I'm not sure of. I don't think there's any Merlot there. Awesome. Well, guys... We're at the end of our time. This means that this is the last time that we're going to be able to connect through Summer Sippin'. I hope that y'all will go back and watch these episodes, and I hope that y'all will stay in touch. Um, if you would like to, um, there's my email there. Whenever you're coming on to site, ask for me or let me know that you're coming. Um, I'd love to make sure that y'all have a wonderful time uh, every time you come out to William Chris. Um, Francisco says there is Merlot at Uplift, so, you know, who knows what the possibilities of this will be? Uh, Michelle, great question. Is there a red William Chris wine that I would recommend for Thanksgiving? Absolutely, I would. I think, um, let's see. If you are a Magnum Club member, the one that comes to mind is the Timmins Estate Merved. And having a Magnum bottle of a lovely William Chris Merved is just a, a showstopper at Thanksgiving. But if you are not a Magnum Club member, the Artist Blend is my go-to for this uh, Thanksgiving. It, um, it'll pair to a lot of different things because you have four different grapes playing around there. If you're going towards the prime rib side of things, if you're less a turkey person, more of those dark beef meats, uh, Hunter is your staple. And um, I think Timmins Tanat would be really, really love, lovely with a prime rib. But if you are sticking to more uh, turkey style of things or chicken, go for your lighter reds. Go for the Artist Blend. Go for a rosé. That would be really, really lovely. Um, Francisco, any other thoughts? Uh, our wines are made to be 
Old world, low intervention style, which means they are inherently very food friendly. So you could really go wild. Um, pick something from your collection or go on our shop page and put yourself together a pack of six wines that you've never had before. I guarantee you all of them are made to pair to food and none of them will taste terrible. So go for it. Taste the wines beforehand, assess them, and chill them down or warm them up, decant them to your needs, and you will make them pair to what you need to pair to. Um, yeah, Francisco, the Wanderer Relief, um, the Wanderer Series Relief Project, that Senso Carignan blend would be really, really great. It has that little kiss of residual sugar. That is such a food friendly thing. So all of a sudden your food is going to taste richer and juicier and your wine's going to taste drier. And uh, having wine that starts off a little bit sweeter is wonderful for that. Francisco, that's a great, great recommendation and probably should have been my first, my first one. Um, and just to throw out there, the Broken Hands would be a wonderful showstopper at Thanksgiving as well. So if you'd like some of that, um, we have a little bit left. All right, guys. I think this is it. Uh, so thank you so much. Again, know that all of these sessions were tailored to you. And I'm so incredibly proud of you for continuing through this entire series, asking the questions that you asked and learning this much in-depth information about Texas wine. Um, you know that at William Chris Wine Company, we are ever growing. We are trying to not only uplift the grapes and the places around Texas, but the education. So we will be back with more content. This isn't the last time y'all are going to see me. As I continue through my wine studies, I hope that y'all will join me and reach out to me for any recommendations, advice, etc. cetera, um, because that is exactly what we're here for. So without further ado, here is a final toast to you guys. Thank you so much for joining me and uh, I will see you next time. Cheers.